Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. I'm a storyboard artist and illustrator, and today we're going to finish off um, a mermaid that we started last week with some uh, flying fish. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to fix um, your pen and ink drawing when you've screwed it up. Um, this is a ballpoint pen. And this will work for ballpoint pen and for just about any other kind of pen if you've got good paper. The paper that I'm working on is Arches Hot Press um, 140 pound or 300 gram watercolor paper. So the thing is is that it's it's almost a bristle and so it can take a bit of scrubbing. It's got size in it and again it's arches so it's quality paper and the size holds the fibers together size is a type of glue and what we're going to do is um i did, made some mistakes you can see around here where the the flying fish and the mermaid's waist are and in a few areas that mm, i'm not pleased with so what i'm going to do it's like it's a little bit too scumbly in here with my pen lines i was a little bit too loose the first thing we're going to do is I have a kneaded eraser. Um, I talk about this all the time because, again, when I first started working um, in any kind of drawing, I didn't know these things exist. They look like silly putty, and you clean them like silly putty. You can see the dark lines in it as I pull it apart and push it together. That cleans, it basically distributes the graphite into the fibers of the latex. I believe it's made out of um, rubber that air has been whipped into. And um, the Renaissance artists used to use a racer like this made out of bread dough. So if you wanted to mix um, basically just water and flour together, you can come up with your own kneaded eraser. It'll leave a bit of residue, more residue than this will. This won't leave any residue, which is why I like it. Now I've got, um, I erased some of my pencil line, but not much. So I'm gonna go over the entire piece I'm holding down it pretty firmly with my left hand and I'm erasing it with my um, right. Now, there have been times when I have done this and if I'm using a less thick paper, the um, <laughs> sometimes I'll buckle the paper because I'm, I'm rubbing too hard. But with a, a, a strong paper like this, you can pretty well go over it and nothing will happen. You can see the, the pencil lines are quickly coming away and it doesn't do anything to the paper and it doesn't do anything to um, my ink lines. Now the next thing I'm going to do is after I've done all that, this is a piece of, I, I've cut off a piece of, um, um, this is Mars Statler plastic eraser. Um, this is basically any kind of eraser. Most of um, your kids erasers are made out of the same sort of substance. And the problem with some, uh, an eraser like this, it'll leave those little, I call them nubblies. You can call them whatever you want, the little extra pieces of plastic from erasing things behind. But that this will get up any leftover residue that you've got of the um, pencil um, behind. And then just take that over and dust it off into a waste paper basket. I have waste paper basket off camera so and then um, I'll go over it one more time with the kneaded eraser and that'll also pick up any any little nubblies that have stayed behind on your watercolor or on the paper okay now now there's a few areas on here it's like right here where the um, mermaid's body comes in um, right here, I don't like the the tangent here, and I'm not real happy with you know the way I I, I did the drawing here. So what I'm going to use in this time, you can use an exacto knife blade, you can use um, a straight um, razor that like you use for scraping off paint, or you can use this as a standard um, utility knife blade. You can buy these in like hundred um, packs, and they're very inexpensive, um, and they're very sharp be careful. So it's like, you know, don't, don't let your cat or your kids get a hold of them. Okay. So here's a little piece that I don't like there. What I'm doing is I'm rubbing the knife. 
across the paper with the flat of the blade so that it scrubs away that top layer of paper. And so it, it acts almost like it, it, you're sanding away the top layer. And it's like here where I don't like this edge. Um, what I can do to here, like I, say, I usually say don't use the point, um, but if you very, very gently use the tip, you can get a, get a little bit more detailed into the edge. And what I'll generally do is just get scrape off what you really don't want first. Don't um, worry about being too precise. And I'm just getting back. And the thing is, is that if I go too far, you can, I can come back in with a pen again, too. So if I, I scrape more off than I want to scrape off, I can always come back in with a pen. And the thing is, is that you'll see when I start going over this in the watercolor, there might be some discrepancy in color, some difference, but it'll be the type of difference that only you as the artist are aware of. Um, the viewer won't even know that you did anything wrong there because it's the, the um, difference in the paper is so minor. They won't even be able to see it. So you can see I'm just, I'm getting that fully cleaned away. Because, because I've got so much dust here, I'm going to take it off camera and scoop it, dump it into the waste basket again. And then I'm going to come in with a kneaded eraser. And then the latex eraser. bring it down with the kneaded eraser again until that when you put your finger over it you can feel a little bit of raising so I'm going to come back in here with the uh, the knife blade again and just ever so slightly sand that down a little bit more so that the extra fibers that are sticking up and you want to go maybe one way and then the next the uh, other way so if you like going horizontal then change it and go vertical and you're just trying to get very, very lightly. The amount of pressure that I am putting on this is very meager. It's just enough, like I said, to like sand down. And, and again, when it's just that little bit of paper, the kneaded eraser will, will pick it all up. So you can see there's just a light hint of where that line is. And I'll come back in with a pen now and clean that up and get it more to where I wanted it to be. And right here, I'm really not liking this line at all. So I want to clean this back. And you see, it doesn't take very long. It just takes a little bit of bravery. And it's like, if, if you, you've already feel you've ruined the the piece by oh geez the drawing was really good in so many places except for that one place right there and I really liked it and I didn't want to throw the piece away because I, I, I did such a good job on it except for that one place right there that's how you fix it so that you can fix up that one place where you made the mistake now, let me dust that off And clean it up again with a kneaded eraser. And I'm gonna get this this portion right here in her that's covering her breasts. I will be happy the day when we no longer have an attitude towards the naked body as something that's you know something that should be covered or you know you should be able to go down to the beach and take off your shirt as a girl. I mean guys have been doing it all my life I mean I don't understand you know why girls don't get to do it too because if you've ever been skinny dipping there is nothing like going in the water without your clothes on it feels so good and I, I I'm personally you know I'm an art artist I'm sure you are too and therefore you know it's like you're used to wanting to draw the human form the way it is I mean we wear clothes so that, 
you know, it's cold. I want to be warm. I put clothes on. And also, you know, our certain body parts get in the way sometimes. So if you have clothing to keep your body parts from interfering with daily chores and stuff, you know, they pre clothing protects your body parts from getting injured. You know, if I'm out chopping wood, I'm definitely going to be wearing jeans and a nice sweatshirt so that I don't get wood chips on me. But, you know, if you're swimming, well, can protect you, and barely protect you from jellyfish. And most people don't, most people wear next to nothing anyways nowadays. But I, I really think, you know, it's, it's a shame that, you know, if I draw a mermaid, you know, or the mythical mermaids, or centaurs, or anything that's half human, it's that, that is half animal and half human and doesn't wear clothes, it's like, we have to clothe them because there's certain parts that kids couldn't, shouldn't see. One of um, my favorite, uh, I, I bought a book when I was in Holland once where it shows this little boy and he's he's peeing at the beach. He You know, he's, he's in his altogether nude and he's peeing on the beach. And it's just a beach scene. It's all, all, all the people all there at the beach and he's just one little piece of the entire scene. And it's like, you'd show me somebody who hasn't seen a four-year-old just pull it down and go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's very human. There we go. So, that's our temporary cleanup. And I really still don't like what's going on here. So I'm going to just pull that down. And you can hear that scraping of my pulling back. I'm sanding down the paper there. Like I said, next thing we're going to do is paint this. So we'll see what happens. Okay, now also, as I just had, there it is, looking for paper towel. We're going to use a big stick today. And so as I pull it under under camera, this is your standard Bic uh, crystal clear stick. Um, the tip of the pen gets a buildup of glop on it and um, I usually will um, rub the tip off and also so I'm looking for a scrap piece of paper of course um, you want to just before you start you know make sure that it's running working okay so I'm gonna go back in and clean up this is supposed to be like, um, it would be seaweed or um, kelp that is covering her. I want a little bit more of a fluted line to it. I, I do kind of a scribbly line as it is. And then, there we go. I want this more of an arch over the fish's head so that I don't have that, that tangent that I had before. There we go. That's a little better. And when I get totally done with this, it's still pretty loose. I'm going to go in and clean up all the lines. I will heavy up all the lines because while you're painting, especially with watercolor, if you're not using, like, say, um, I also use liquid acrylic, does not have as heavy a pigment in it, whereas watercolor has a very heavy pigment in it. So if you're, you're painting with watercolor, especially if you're using yellows or earth tones, um, uh, the color will cover up your line work. So if, even if you're using, um, say, um, um, traditional pen and ink and you're using um, watercolor over it, any of your CAD, cadmium yellows, um, your ultramarines and cobalt blues, they're heavy in pigment. And which is great because that's one of the reasons why those colors will last longer is because they're not dye based, they're pigment based. And but the other thing is, is that if you're painting over line work, they will cover up the line. So it's nice to go over the line again afterward if you want to crisp up the line. And it's not cheating, 
It's like, you know, some people think, oh, well, I already did the line, or I don't want to do more lines. It's like, no, if you want to crisp up the color, you got to go back in. I'm just kind of giving myself an idea of where I want to put some some foam here, lightly there. And then her arm, I might go back in and, and clean that up too after the fact, where her thumb is. It doesn't need, eh, I should probably do it right now. Yeah. I better do that right now. So I'm going to clean up that thumb real fast. This, this little fingernail that is not a fingernail that's sticking out here. Yeah, I'm going to dot that because right now the ink is a little bit wet. The problem is with, with um, um, ballpoint pen, it does take a little curing time. It doesn't um, dry immediately. So, there. okay. So now we're going to start painting. Um, I'm going to use my uh, my Cotman uh, traveling kit. This is a Cotman traveling watercolor kit. They're relatively inexpensive. You can pick one up for around anywhere between um, fifteen to twenty dollars. Um, I would highly recommend. Um, um, Good old Amazon. Good old Amazon. It all depends on how you your your attitude towards Amazon is. And let me put water here. So I'm trying to get everything. Let's see here. So you can see what's going on. My camera's being persnickety. As usual. Much. So I'm trying to get it to adjust where I want to get so I can we can see more what's going on with the painting. So you can see when I add water and take water away. That's good enough. Um, you'll notice I'm not taping this one down. I probably should. There's going to be a little bit of buckling, but not a lot. Again, if you're using um, a uh, 140 pound paper or, your, or 300 gram. Most of the watercolor, you know, I keep on giving you the, the, the weight of the paper, but most of the watercolor that you'll get in pads or um, um, blocks will be of this weight. Um, so you don't really have to worry about it too much because that's the normal weight for most uh, watercolor that you buy in pads or blocks. My problem is with some of the pads, um, it's not always the best watercolor paper. What I'm doing right now is I'm kind of um, cleaning up my uh, my palette here with the Cotman. Let me open and close it for you. Um, it, it's really cool. It's just this this little kit and um, a, a travel brush will fit right in here. And you can close it and take it with you anywhere. I usually use a um, um, an old um, container that they used to use for um, a film canister that you used to use for 35 millimeter film is what I'll use to carry my water in. Unfortunately, um, those are rarer than they used to be, so I'm not sure what kind of water they were, were airtight. So it's like I kept a lot of them because I used to shoot a lot of 35 millimeter film. And because of that, you can um, carry around water with you in a small quantities and you don't have to worry about it spilling in whatever kind of satchel or whatever you're carrying with you. Let me get that in the shot better. Okay. And I, not, we're not really seeing my palette here. So let me, let me pull up the camera just a bit here. Sorry for the... Yeah. It's like you're trying to get everything in it just right so you, you can see. There we go. That's a little bit better so you can see what's going on. I had, had the differences between I wanted you to see um, what's going on when I did the revisions and what I'm doing now. Now this is um, uh, 
a cobalt and uh, a Prussian blue in this kit. This is more of a, a cobalt blue. I don't think that they actually um, um, call it cobalt. Um, usually when it's not cobalt, they'll, they'll give another name to it, especially if it comes in a, um, a kit like this. And um, I'm not exactly sure what, what uh, Windsor Newton calls all their colors in, in the cotton. But this is basically a reddish blue. So it's, it's basically an ultramarine or a cobalt. Um, ultramarine is usually more to the um, purpley side of blue. And uh, so is co cobalt is actually too. And then um, Prussian blue is your beautiful turquoise blue-green. And um, that's this one right here. It's more of a, a green-blue. So I like to mix them. I'm doing water here. So I'll mix a little bit. This is a little bit of wet into wet to get a little bit of mixing of, of the two colors. And then I'm leaving a lot of empty underneath her for little speckles of water, of um, like foam. Whenever you have uh, the waves come up, it's like all this stuff up there is going to be like foam. I might put a little bit of, of green or brown into that to give it some shadow or maybe a little purple. We'll see where we get there. Um, and the reason why I say we'll, we'll see when we get there because um, when, she, we, when I paint her, We'll see what harmonizes best with what's underneath her. And that's why it's like sometimes when I'm I'm painting, I'll have a plan of exactly what I'm going to do, and sometimes I won't. Okay, now that we've got a little bit of that cobalt into the water, I'm thinking that's a little bit too blue. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the sky. So the sky is going to be... I'm going to put a little bit of pink into the, my... Um, I'm using um, the Prussian blue and I'm watering it down quite a bit and I'm just stippling it I'm just gonna you know it's like I'm making big I'm making big little puddles that makes a lot of sense doesn't it big and little puddle but I'm just gonna kind of dabble it and I'm thinking too the the background should be a little bit more of a um, cool blue and the fish should be probably a warm um, more of the turquoise green blue so I'm probably that's um, and they are that color they 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 uh, are this gorgeous um, green blue um, when I'm um, my mom used to live in Mexico and I got to go out fishing a couple of times and when I first saw flying fish the ones down in Mexico are quite large and if you see flying fish that means also there's a, a fish they call um, dolphin it's not a dolphin it's not like the mammal but they call it dolphin or mahi mahi is what the um, the um, Hawaiians call it it's a very tasty fish and they eat flying fish so the mahi mahi are pretty pretty big themselves and whenever you see flying fish you know that the the mahi mahi or, or the dolphin are nearby because they eat the flying fish. But the first time I, I didn't see like schools of flying fish, I saw one or two of them, and they were huge. And when I say huge, I'm saying they're probably about one to uh, two feet, which is pretty big. I mean, I always thought that flying fish were kind of like um, maybe. Uh, um, six six inches long because they fly and they really fly they jump out of the water and they use those those uh, the, those fins of theirs to to soar okay and I'm gonna do a little bit closer on this now what's happened is because I've, I've done the, the spotting when I come back in and I start filling in the white spaces I will get a more modeled appearance which is what I want. I don't want a perfectly flat color um, for two reasons. Number one, it's really tough. 
I have been I do get I can get flat color if I really want flat color um, but it's it's also you have to really work at it to get it right and the model color has more interest to it so you get um, with very little work you get all this fun kind of skittery detail now we're gonna do her I'm trying to think I'm gonna give her a bit of I want to have a little bit darker skin color maybe um, I'm gonna use a little bit of burnt sienna and I probably th throw in a little bit of a green hue to it but right now I'm gonna just do burnt sienna um, I like my mermaids Polynesian or somebody pointed out, you know, the, the new Little Mermaid that um, Disney put out, the live action, the Little Mermaid is black, which I absolutely adore because um, the Doheny and a lot of the, um, the coastal um, African tribes have a lot of legends of mermaids and they have goddesses who are sea goddesses. So it's because they live near the coast and of course you would have mermaids if you live near the coast and the water and so why wouldn't mermaids be black why wouldn't they be dark skinned I should say um, and I love cocoa colored skin um, it's very beautiful and I think that uh, Polynesian girls are very pretty and African American girls are very pretty and it's about time that, that we recognize that there we go so she's going to be a very tan mermaid. She's been playing this one a lot. And she might, like I said, she might be ethnically Polynesian. And while that's a little bit, I'm going to take, let's see here, a little bit of a lizard and crimson. That's the, the red pink down here. up some green throw it into some turquoise blue playing out the Prussian blue and I believe this is a permanent green Yeah, might get my yellows a bit dirty with put it throwing the blue in there but if they get too dirty by throwing the the blue in I'll just take a paper towel and wipe them out I'm lazy I'm very lazy when it comes to my colors I'm lazy when it comes to my brushes I beat them up that's why it's like I highly recommend like I said get um, get uh, Windsor Newton series 7 sable brushes any kind of brush you get if you can afford sable go for it um sable <laughs> sable fur keeps a licking and t keep and takes a licking and keeps on ticking it's the old uh, timex watch saying and you'll notice too um i'm not good about keeping my water clean it's a personal thing um i'm not doing large enough paintings that my water is going to get dirty enough that it really affects the color all that much um, a good um, conscientious painter would keep their water clean I am a bit of a slob now I got too much color in there too much green so I, I'm blotting it out with a paper towel and I want to come in with more blue under here And that blue will bleed up into the green that I just blotted. And maybe 
maybe not as much as I'd like. Let's see. And that's the thing too. One of the, with watercolor, the colors will change as it dries. By the time this totally dries, it will be um, different looking than I originally planned. It just happens every time. That's what happens. Is that it usually will die, die bleh, sorry, my apologies. It will die, dry lighter than what you intended. And it will often dry richer. Um, you'll get colors that you weren't expecting to appear in places that you weren't expecting. Um, just because when the paint dries, when certain um, elements, the, um, the different pigments that are used to make the paint will, um, when they blend with each other, will um, create a different color. One of the things that I really love, um, or one of my co favorite color combinations is mixing um, a lizard crimson with a blue-green um, or a magenta with a blue-green because you get purples a lot of the times like you weren't expecting. It's like, let's I'll take a little bit of lizard crimson right now. I'm going to do a little stripe. here and you'll see when that when that dries you'll see you get some very unusual and interesting colors going on there okay and I'm gonna do the mermaid in a similar I'm gonna make her green And we're going to throw some of that green into the ocean too. Once once I paint the mermaid and I get a good feeling about what I want done with her tail, I'm going to throw some yellow into that tail. Yeah. We'll throw some green into the ocean too, so it blends in with her. So she's not like right now. It's it's really nice. I could either leave it this way where she stands out against the blue or I can throw more um, blue into the uh, or green into the ocean. I'm thinking probably what I'll do is I'll put, throw some more blue into her. You know, you want to get that harmony going. So it's like by the time I end, I will be mixing a few colors from um, one side of the painting to the other. And I'm gonna... Now the um, kelp will run from red to brown to golden. If you um, go um, pick it up off the, uh, the beach, it's usually more of a golden and a brown. So I'm gonna start with the yellow. I think I might come in with a little bit of purple to brown that up. And then her hair. I'm going to do her hair. Yeah, I'm going to do her hair green. So I was thinking about Ariel and, and giving her red hair. But I think she needs, she needs green hair. better. And I'm going to make that ear brown. And I'm probably going to give it a little bit of green veining. And you notice I'm not real careful about where, you know, some of the brown flows into the green. 
because I'm thinking that that adds to the harmonizing wherever you you think you've you've overpainted it's like go in with a color you weren't quite thinking about doing and I'm gonna stipple a little brown into her scales throw a little bit of green into the water. Take some of that green that we've put on her. And I'm going to do it rather thinly. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to blot that. There. So I've got just a tint of that color down there. And then I'm going to come in with a, a smaller brush. I've been using a size 2 for most of this. I'm going to come in with my 0. And I am going to make some purple. Some purple and some blue. Because there's... So I'm to mix purple I'm using um, alizarin crimson. This um, pinky red And then a little bit of, I'm using a little bit of the Prussian because you can see it goes real dark when I use the Prussian. Even, and it's primarily because there's a little bit of green in there and when you add green and red together, they're complements. So you'll get, it'll look a little on the muddy side, it's a muddy side of purple, but it's, it'll be really rich on here. Yeah, that's a little bit too dark. Actually, I'm thinking for her shadows. Now, nah, maybe now that I did that, I'm going. Mm. Now, do I want to put some red in there? I just want to lighten that up a bit. I'm like going back and forth between the two. See, that's really dark. I want quite that dark. So, what I'm going to do? My down dark, paper towel, blot it up. There we go. Anything that goes down a little bit too dark, paper towel. And then this area underneath her neck. So now I'm doing just spot shadows. And again, um, because their watercolor goes down dark and it dries light, and it's just getting used to, and I gotta give her, it's like, realize, oh my word, I didn't give her any, uh, she's got to have webbing, so I'm going to give her webbing between her fingers. She's a mermaid, she's got to have webbing. Let's put a little yellow in there too. Let's put a little bit of purple in the flying fish. A little purple in her tail. Because you've got that yellow green, and it makes for nice shadows. That's pretty much it for the painting. Now, I'm going to go show you what I'm going to do. It's still a little damp. So normally what I would probably do is let this dry for a while. Um, maybe 20 minutes or so. And then go in with ballpoint pen. But right now I'm going to... I don't really need to do that. So I've got a piece of tape on it. Oh. Occupational hazard in my studio. Always tape somewhere. I suppose it's one of the things you don't have to worry about with uh, computers anymore, is you don't have to worry about cutting things, and you don't have to worry about tape. 
And what I'm doing right now is I'm giving, I'm heaving up the outline. And this is not necessarily something you have to do. This is just me. This is my style. It's what I like to do. But again, I feel that it helps um, the images stand out a little bit more. They um, are more distinct. If I want to go in and throw some more detail in. And you can tell there's a little bit of buckling in the paper. Like I said, if you want to... Uh, Make sure there's no buckling in your paper. Uh, tape it down with Scotch Magic Tape or some kind of the, um, not a cellophane tape, but something that's more like Scotch Magic Tape. Now, like I said, let me see, I'm trying to bring this up. Well, if my camera focus on it. No, it's not gonna focus on it. But there's, um, there's a glob of ink on the edge of my paper and I just, or I'm not, sorry, the end of my pen and I just wiped it off just because I don't want um, the excess globs on the piece, not on this one. Sometimes I do want those excess globs. Sometimes I, I'm willing to just, you know, I'm doing the piece and I want to see the punctuation that my hand will create by, um, allowing those globs to exist but in this case I'd like I'd like it to be a little bit more detailed I'm just about done here like I said um you can see now where we cleaned away the uh, excess pen and I'm going in and I'm adding detail And you wouldn't know that those areas had been reworked and cleaned up. And well, like I said, with, with um, I've gotten rather sketchy, more sketchy as time has gone on in my style. Sometimes I'm extremely precise, but I've I've come to the conclusion I I, I like the free form line too. I like the the glops and the the skittery lines sometimes too. It's I like both lines. It's like, why do I have to choose? I want both of them. Um, it's kind of like with my styles. I'm afraid I have quite too many styles just because there's so many ways that I like to draw and so many ways that I like to express myself that I really don't want to stick to one style. And, you know, too many people want to pigeonhole and say, oh, well, what's your style? Well, what? got quite a few of them what do you which one do you want and um, I like my ballpoint pen I like what ballpoint pen does I like um, I like the glops I like the thick and thin of it it um, is not always um, pure black it comes out gray it comes out purple it comes out um, with different qualities to it and I figure um, when you do a sun test with it, I mean, it, it, it will fade with age, but it's going to take a, <laughs> several hundred years before this stuff fades. Um, you know, it's like you might as well I'm not do watercolor at all if you're worried too much about fading. Because you will get some fading with watercolor when you hang it on the wall. But again, the heavier the pigmented of the watercolor, the less problem you have with that. Tighten things up. Give her some more scales. And I think we're just about done. Put some scales on them. Flying fish. And flying fish are usually more blue than that. I just kind of like the them being a similar green to the girl. Sign it. Let's take it. And 
that's it. That's our mermaid. Thank you very much for stopping by. Um, there will be another video up next week. Um, I really appreciate your coming around and taking a look at my work. And I hope that uh, I help you uh, get to do more of your watercolors. Thank you very much. Again, Lynn Hunter, uh, hit the like, subscribe. Appreciate you being here. Bye-bye.